Good evening, uh, everyone. I'm uh, Professor Barlo Dermogradichin of the Armenian Studies Program at Fresno State. I'd like to welcome you to this evening's uh, presentation. Tonight's uh, presentation is part of the Armenian Studies Program lecture series. We have a lecture series in the fall and, the, and in the spring. Tonight's presentation is also being co-sponsored uh, by the Department of Music at Fresno State. And I'd like to thank them for their co-sponsorship of this evening's uh, presentation. All of our events uh, last semester and this semester are being held uh, through Zoom and are being live streamed to YouTube and archived there. And you can go to the Armenian Studies Program YouTube channel in order to watch this program afterwards or if you need to leave a little bit earlier. Uh, at, after the presentation, you will have an opportunity to ask questions to our guest. And at the bottom of your screen, you should have a chat function and you can communicate with me through the chat. If you have any uh, questions, make sure that you, you do do it through the chat. We're asking people not to just speak up, just to do uh, ask the questions uh, through, through the chat. Uh, at this point, I'm going to uh, do a very brief PowerPoint uh, telling about some of the upcoming events of the Armenian Studies Program coming up in the months of February and March. So I'm gonna share a screen with you. These are the upcoming events uh, of the Armenian Studies Program. You can follow us on Facebook or on our Armenian Studies Program Twitter account. I do have an, uh, a radio program that I am hosting called All Things Armenian. It's a one hour radio show every Sunday from two to three o'clock. We also have a lecture by Dr. Zainab Devrim Gersel coming up on Thursday, February the 25th. It's on portraits of unbelonging, photography, the Ottoman state and Armenians leaving for America. Uh, her presentation is about how photography played a role in immigration for Armenians who were leaving for America. She's an anthropologist that teaches at Rutgers University. On Saturday, March the 6th, Tatsul Hakopian, who is an independent journalist from the Republic of Armenia, will speak upon the topic of the 44 day disaster, why it happened as it did. And it will discuss the September and through November war in Artsakh in Armenia uh, in 2020. He's an independent journalist and it will be co-sponsored by the Homanet Men Fresno Sassoon chapter. On Thursday, March the 11th, Dr. James Russell will present his new book called Misak Medzarents, The Complete Lyric Poems, which was published as part of the Armenian Studies series, Armenian series as part of the press at California State University Fresno. And the book was just published as volume 12 uh, Dr. Russell is Emeritus Professor of Armenian Studies at Harvard University. That will be Thursday, March the 11th. On Friday, March the 19th, Dr. Zovinar Derderian will speak about the migrants from Vaughan and the transforming politics of representation in the Ottoman Empire. And that is going to be, that presentation uh, will take place at 7 p.m. Uh, she's uh, got her doctorate from the University of Michigan, and that's her area of expertise. So she'll be talking about that topic. And then Dr. Khachik Muradyan, who is newly appointed at the Library of Congress, will speak upon his new book called The Resistance Network, The Armenian Genocide and Humanitarianism. The Armenian Genocide and Humanitarianism in Ottoman Syria, 1915 to 1918. This book is his a doctoral dissertation, which was prepared for publication. As you can see, all of our um, all of our events have registration links. Again, you can follow us on Facebook or uh, at the Armenian Studies Fresno State Facebook, or go to our Armenian Studies Program website, and all of our upcoming events are located uh, there. So tonight, we're happy to uh, welcome today as our guest, Dr. Joseph Bohigian. He's a composer and performer whose cross-cultural experience as an Armenian American is a defining message in his music. I'm happy to say that Dr. Bohigian is a graduate of Fresno State, and he received his bachelor's degree in music composition and a minor in Armenian studies in 2015. And he was, uh, the recipient of the 2015 President's Medal, which is the highest honor bestowed on an under, undergraduate student uh, by President Castro in 2015. So he's a very distinctive uh, student. 
And he recently defended his uh, doctorate in music through the Stony Brook University Department of Music. Uh, and tonight he will be speaking about his doctoral composition uh, and we'll be talking about his exploration of expressions of exile, cultural reunification, and identity maintenance in the diaspora. Uh, he'll be talking about that, so I'm not going to say more about that. But his works have been performed and heard at the Oregon uh, Bach Festival, the Walt Disney Concert Hall, uh, the New Music on the Point Festival, and also in Armenia at the Aram Khachadurian uh, Museum Hall. And I think he'll be speaking more about that as well today. So really his presentation is a very personal journey about how he finds Armenia through music. And he will be talking about the composer Komidas and about the influence of Armenian music on his own music and how his dissertation called The Water Has Found Its Crack, his musical doctoral composition, uh, traces concepts and ideas of displacement, dispersion, and reclamation in Armenian music. Uh, so it's a very interesting topic uh, as well. So we're very happy to welcome uh, Dr. Bohigian to Fresno State to speak. Uh, the first time he's coming back to Fresno State uh, after his graduation to speak. And he's going to speak on again, the topic is the water has found its crack, finding Armenia through music. Uh, welcome Dr. Bohigian. Thank you. I just like to start by saying thank you to Barlow and the Armenian Studies Program, as well as the Department of Music for co-sponsoring. Um, and just to let everybody know, there will be some musical examples, uh, like with scores on the presentation, but if you don't read music, don't worry, it's not necessary to understand them. Uh, I'll be playing audio as well for those. Okay. So in a 2005 article, Turkish Armenian journalist and editor Hurant Dink tells the story of a French Armenian woman who died while visiting the village of her youth in Turkey. When the question of where she should be buried arose, a Turkish man from the village responded, let be here, the water has found its crack. This response carries a lot of profound meaning. It for, refers to a story of the Armenian longing to be reunited with their indigenous land. This longing is not motivated by a need to take the land, but as Dink says, to come and be buried under it. This longing is the part of uh, an Armenian story where its people through centuries of foreign domination and dispersion have emphasized the importance of maintaining identity in diaspora. This longing motivates the need that Armenians display for a unification, if not physically, then at least spiritually. This concept of the water finding its crack reflects that many Armenians of the diaspora, myself included, have about our idea of homeland and our relationship to it. These questions motivated me as I traveled to Armenia and began composing The Water Has Found Its Crack for three sopranos, violin, viola, cello, and percussion. This piece would become a musical manifestation of my exploration of Armenian identity. It's its title from the Hurantink story and explores this in both a figurative and literal manner. At a figurative level, lingering sliding tones glide between notes acting as reconstructions of Armenian folk and sacred songs. On a more literal level, the idea of the water finding its crack is represented in the text, which references water as an exploration of displacement, dispersion, and reclamation. In this presentation, I'll trace these three elements as they affect Armenian culture and the negotiation of internal and external identity boundaries in diaspora. The homeland is a central magnetic point for Armenians. However, defining boundaries of the conceptions of homeland is not simple, given the differences between the Western Armenian culture mainly upheld in the diaspora and the Eastern Armenian culture which predominates in the Republic of Armenia. An example of the separation of homeland is shown in Mount Ararat, the national symbol of Armenia. Ararat poignantly looms over the Armenian capital of Yerevan and is visible from most parts of the city, yet it lies just over the closed border with Turkey. It is a reminder of the geographical and spiritual separation of Armenians from their indigenous land and culture. The symbolism of Ararat's physical closeness and practical distance is an apt representation of homeland. The concept of an Armenian homeland is not limited to a physical place. 
for example, in her Dining in Diaspora project, which illustrates the Armenian experience in America through food, journalist Liana Akhajanyan asks, where is home? What does home even mean? Her answer, Armenia may be a country, but it is also a concept, one that functions independent of geography, displays this notion of a reconstituted homeland divorced from place. This idea is echoed by Armenian American author, William Saroyan, who defiantly wrote in 1935, two decades after the start of the genocide, go ahead, destroy this race. See if the race will not live again when two of them meet in a beer parlor 20 years after and laugh and speak in their tongue. For much of my life, this sentiment by Saroyan rings true. The great grandson of genocide survivors, displacement was always a part of my family history. Yet, however close I felt to Armenianness, a sense of feeling uh, disconnected from it remained. I was simultaneously both belonging and not belonging to the culture. This feeling of distance is what brought me to Armenia to be rerouted. My piece, The Water of This Crack, is my response to how I experience rerootedness. Displacement has a central role in Armenian history. Although Armenians have lived outside of their homeland for centuries, the displacement of the genocide engenders within Armenians a stress on the importance of maintaining their Armenian identity. Subsequent displacements from Lebanon, Azerbaijan, Syria, and most recently Artsakh have turned exile for some Armenian families into a constant state of being. The themes of displacement and loss motivating reclamation are important because of the need to preserve cultural identity. This intention is embedded in Armenian music. For example, one of the most well-known Armenian national heroes is the composer, musicologist, and priest Komitas. Komitas dedicated his life to the preservation and promotion of Armenian music around the turn of the 20th century. His music comes during a time when Armenians were facing in increasing issues of self-preservation uh, due to the per persecution in the Ottoman Empire. For Komitas, the documentation of native Armenian music was a way to preserve Armenian culture. He promoted music as a living art to be used in daily life and was committed to extensive ethnomusicological research in order to identify its distinctive features. Komitas focused on rural music as the most authentic expression of Armenian music. He argued that Armenian music in rural villages was less influenced by the music of other cultures when compared to Armenian music in cosmopolitan cities. By focusing on what he viewed as the most pure form of Armenian music, Komitas argued for the singularity that defines Armenian music and by extension, the uniqueness of Armenians as a people at a time of rising ethnic and national consciousness among the peoples of the Ottoman Empire. Although much of Komitas's research was lost during the genocide, his existing work today is celebrated both in the diaspora and in Armenia. Among the songs collected by Komitas, dispossession was a recurring theme. A longing for the homeland or those who have traveled away from it can especially be seen in the song genre. These songs center either on people in foreign places asking for news from the homeland or people longing for the return of their loved ones. The singer typically asks migratory birds to send news to her family or rivers from news from faraway places. One example of a migrant song is Kurunk, meaning crane. In Kurunk, the migrant repeatedly pleads, Crane, have you no news from our country? Yet he receives no response. The text for the water has found its crack, which you can see on this slide here, consists of fragments from eight Armenian folk songs transcribed by Komitas, which I gathered while working at the Komitas Museum Institute in Yerevan. Many of the text fragments recall the themes of the migrant songs, using water as a metaphor for distance, longing, and loss. For example, from the song Tunari comes, Water Has Destroyed My House. From Kakaviyirk, you present a heart to the sea of grief. And from Garun, spring has passed and autumn came. Water has stopped flowing from its source. The text fragments are reassembled so that sometimes a whole section comes from one song, but in other places, each line comes from a different song. So for example, the whole first section comes from the song Durkugavit Vidin Saren, and the second section, each of the three lines comes from three different songs. In this way, I construct a new narrative on the theme of displacement from these text fragments. 
The central section of the piece is a quasi folk song, which I compose. It is closely connected to the migrant genre of folk songs, dealing with issues of dispossession and longing. The text comes from two songs, Tunari and Tsiranitsar, and tells of the destruction of home and the separation from loved ones. The song, which is shown on this slide for those who can read music and which I'll refer to from now on as Jura Tunis Kandera, meaning water has destroyed my house, embodies the feelings of displacement and loss in the folk song by borrowing different musical characteristics from them. It is sung slowly and freely and is highly ornamented. In these qualities, it is also similar to the style of migrant songs that I talked about before and the tacher or odes, a genre of monodic song developed in the 10th century, which is characterized by chromaticism, unrestricted modulation and virtuosity. So I'll play for you now a recording of my quasi folk song. This next slide shows excerpts of three Armenian songs transcribed by Komitas, the folk songs Kurunk and Antuni, and the Hach Tavik. Sorry, Tach Habik. These examples demonstrate similarities in style with my quasi folk song, including in metric freedom, pitch, and melodic ornamentation. In recordings by Komitas and Armanak Shah Muradyan, an Armenian singer who studied with Komitas, all three songs are sung freely without a strong sense of meter or recurring beat patterns. The same is true for Jura Tunis Kandera. In addition, all four examples consist of short melodic phrases of similar lengths, which come to rest on different pitches of the overlapping tetrachords or groups of four pitches which structure Armenian music. So I'll play now for you audio of these three songs and we'll start with Kurunk. Here's an excerpt from the song Antuni. Mm -hmm. 
an excerpt of Havik sung by Komitas. So before I go on, I'm going to explain a little bit about how Armenian music is structured. So according to Komitas, Armenian folk music is built on a series of overlapping tetrachords, or groups of four pitches. So there are three types of tetrachords, which you can see here, Ionian, Dorian, and Phrygian, and I'll play for you what each of those sounds like. So here's the Ionian. Dorian. and the Phrygian. And the inner notes of these tetrachords may also be altered to achieve what's called an augmented second interval. So this is what that sounds like. And I'll play for you now an example of the song Kali Yig, uh, and it'll begin with the Dorian tetrachord and then change to the version with the augmented second. So you can hear that shift partway through. So the connective nature of the overlapping tetrachords is that the highest pitch of one group is also the lowest pitch of the group of four pitches on top of it. So like in the folk songs, my quasi-folk song, Jurutunis Kandera, is structured using this Armenian tetrachord system in the Dorian mode. And I'll play for you what that sounds like when they're stacked. And here's the version with the added augmented second.
like the other song examples, my quasi-folk song is also highly ornamented. The virtuosic, melismatic ornamentations are reminiscent of the melodic style of Havik and the Tahir. The songs also share specific ornamentation figures. Jurutunas Kandira and Kurunk both began with a quick ascending figure from the first note of the tetrachord to the second where it's sustained, increasing tension, and eventually at the end of the phrase releases when it returns to the first pitch. There's a similar type of motion in Antuni, except the ascending second figure is repeated and remains on the second pitch at the end of the first phrase, but it doesn't return to the first pitch until after the end of the second phrase. So I'll play for you those examples. This is the opening of my quasi-folk song. And now here's a very similar melodic motion in the opening of Kurunk. opening of Antuni, where, as I mentioned, the ascending figure is repeated before the second phrase, it returns to the first pitch. Most Armenian music is traditionally based in monody, meaning there is one melodic line or unaccompanied melody. However, when it's performed in a group, as in an ensemble accompanying a singer, the resulting texture can be heterophonic, meaning the one melody is played by different instruments or singers, but with slight variations in the pitch ornamentation or in the rhythm. Likewise, in the water has found its crack, my quasi-folk song is set heterophonically in the voices, so they all have slightly different rhythms and pitches. And the melodic contour of the strings is following that of the voices, sliding to their different pitches and sort of imitating the melodic line. So I'll play for you first. This is an example of Ashharumas Achim Kashi by Sayat Nova, the Ashuch. Um, and you'll hear the accompanying instruments playing a very similar melody to the singer, but with slight differences. Oh, And now I'll play you this full section from The Water Has Found Its Crack. Uh, and you'll hear again a similar idea where the singers are singing slightly different melodies and the strings are trailing them. And so overall it has a sort of heterophonic texture. Oh, 
So with these allusions to folk song idioms and stylistic borrowings from Armenian music, the water has found its crack evokes a concept of displacement. This aspect of displacement is present throughout the piece in that lines radiate out in both directions from this central point to other sections which are less traditionally set, yet still maintain connections in pitch structure, texture, and melodic style to the quasi folk song. The object of the song's abandoned narrator's call for her beloved to hurry up, return, come back, acts as the exile. After displacement, the concept of exile makes up a central part of Armenian identity. The worldwide Armenian diaspora or Armenian population is a classical example of diaspora spanning multiple generations and locations. Repeated displacements and continued Turkish denial of the genocide have made exile central to Armenians self-representation. Edward Said argues that exiles in an attempt to reassemble their broken lives turn to national pride to fend off their exile, framing themselves as a restored people and affirming their place in the home. However, exiles cannot completely divorce themselves from their new diasporic environment. Unlike most people, exiles live with an awareness of at least two cultures, two homes. Borrowing a musical term, Said calls this plurality of vision, which gives rise to an awareness of simultaneous dimensions, contrapuntal, a reference to music with two or more melodies with independent rhythms and melodic contours that contribute to a coherent harmonic whole. In other words, experiences in the new environment exist within the context of the old one. Both are vivid, actual, occurring together contrapuntally. For Armenian descendants of the dispersed, this exilic mindset is passed down from generation to generation. A sense of loss, which is not always spoken, but rather felt, pervades the Armenian collective consciousness. Fears of erasure stemming from the continuous uprooting of Armenian communities have made assimilation a sensitive topic in the diaspora. In response to anxieties about erasure and the precarious existence of Armenian people and culture, many aspects of Armenian diaspora culture, such as literature and politics, express anti-assimilation ideals. Music has played a central role in Armenian maintenance in the diaspora, both in which music is deemed acceptable for formation and which is not. For many, this is through their experience hearing and sometimes singing along to the Badarak or the divine liturgy of the Armenian Apostolic Church. According to Jonathan McCollum in his study of the role of the performance of the Badarak in Armenian identity maintenance among Armenian communities on the east coast of the US, he says Armenians, quote, see the performance of the divine liturgy as integral to their identity, regardless of whether or not they actually participate in the corporate singing of the liturgy. Musicologist Sylvia Alajaji credits the Estradain genre, which began in Beirut in the 1960s, with strengthening, strengthening the sense of Armenian identity among the diaspora-born generation in Lebanon. Through a hybrid genre, uh, which is influenced by pop music from Europe and the Eastern Mediterranean, Estradain music was sung about in Armenian about Armenians. However, Estradain music was also defined by what it was not, Turkish. The rising popularity of Estradi music purposefully came at the expense of the Turkish music popular with the immigrant generation in the name of forming a uniquely Armenian identity. And I'll play for you now just a short excerpt from a song that most of you are probably familiar with. This is Karun Karun by Adi Sarmandyan. <laughs> The question of what music can be considered Armenian or should be listened to by Armenians for the purpose of identity formation has at times been a contentious one. The search for Armenian identity in music has at times led to the exclusion of music shared with other cultures such as the Ottoman era music in which Armenians played an important part. This exclusion was not only for the mixing of languages in the lyrics, but also for musical elements perceived to be non-Armenian, like the use of the oud or quarter tones. Given Armenia's location at the edge of many powerful empires and states and its longstanding diaspora, a common trend throughout Armenian culture is the influence of others. 
However, this cultural exchange goes both ways and is critical to understanding the totality of Armenian music. To borrow from Said, our understanding of Armenian music should be contrapuntal, contextualized interactions with other cultures, both at home and in the diaspora. It is within this context that I, as a third generation Armenian American, relate to the contrapuntality of exilic awareness. How my sense of Armenianness and Americanness exists not in opposition, but in counterpoint. The opening of my piece, The Water Has Found Its Crack, explores these ideas of exile through the metaphor in its title. The beginning of the piece is characterized by long sliding glissandi, or, which are stretched over small pitch ranges. They overlap across the ensemble, expanding and contracting in different directions and at different rates to fill in the cracks caused by larger spacings of pitches. Of the textural fluidity of the glissandi is the fluidity of dispersion, navigating the different levels of exilic awareness as one moves through different places and cultures. The text also concerns fluidity with the opening line, Jud Kugaverin Saren, meaning water streams down the upper hill. As in pitch, single words are stretched across multiple measures, getting into the cracks of the words and expanding them to break them down to their component parts. This is especially true of the word jur, meaning water, which is repeated over and over at the beginning of the piece. The piece approaches the use of the tetrachord structures or four note groupings, which I described earlier in a loose way. Tying the melodic essence of the piece to that of traditional Armenian music without being limited by its rules. In the, as in the quasi folk song, the first section of the piece centers on the central tetrachord G, A, B flat, C, which you can see here. From the beginning, it starts to explore the internal boundaries of the tetrachords with quarter tone glissandi to and from its pitches, filling in the cracks between adjacent half steps, which would be what you would see on a piano. And next, the glissandi push outward toward the edges of the tetrachords up to D flat and down to F and toward the internal shift from A to A flat, protect, reflecting the internal chromatic alteration to achieve an augmented second interval. The glissandi's independent motion and direction and expansion rate across the ensemble is a kind of counterpoint, the counterpoint of exilic awareness. The dissonant beating that results from close overlapping pitches suggests the dissonance in a plural exilic awareness. The slow expansion and contraction of the glissandi pushing at the internal and external boundaries of the tetrachord system is meant to bring a sense of unease to an otherwise static texture. In their fluidity, the glissandi are the water filling in the cracks of Armenian collective memory. And I'll play you now an example of the beginning of the piece, the first few minutes.
Sociologist Ani Bakalyan argues in her 1993 study of assimilation and ethnic identity maintenance among New York area Armenians that over generations, Armenian Americans move from being to feeling Armenian. They move from the unconscious or ascribed Armenianness in behavior or temperament of the immigrant generation to the voluntary or symbolic Armenianness pertaining to the emotions of their children or grandchildren. Despite this transition, Armenian diaspora communities around the world are connected through a strong sense of pride in their heritage. The Armenian quality of seeking and reclaiming lost culture is represented across artistic disciplines. In 1975, William Saroyan wrote Beatlis, a play based on his 1964 trip to his family's hometown of Beatlis in Turkey. However, though he had long planned his journey to Beatlis, he first settled for Soviet or Eastern Armenia in 1935. The 29 year gap between these two trips highlights the dissonance many Armenians in the diaspora feel about the nature of their homeland. Soroyan himself wrote about this phenomenon in 1954, stating, I was not unaware that in reaching Soviet Armenia, I would not be reaching my father's Armenia or his city, Bitlis. It was enough at that time to reach the general vicinity of my father's birthplace and to be in a nation named Armenia inhabited by Armenians. The sentiment from Saroyan is common among diaspora Armenians in search of their heritage. It is a sentiment I considered as I moved to Armenia. The Apostolic Church has historically been one of the main centers of reclaiming Armenian identity in diaspora. As illustrated by ethnomusicologist Jonathan McCollum, the music of the church is a particularly significant element for identity maintenance in the Armenian American diaspora separate from the strength of one's religious faith or lack thereof. The final section of The Water Has Found Its Crack imitates Armenian chant, therein reclaiming a music I strongly associate with my Armenian American upbringing. The melody is split between the three sopranos as a hocket, meaning each successive note of the melody is sung by a different person. However, each pitch is sustained, creating an overlapping harmony of clusters. This slide shows an example of Armenian sacred chant, Zutagalvaran Parats Christos, from the Chashu Sharaganer. The chant has phrases of varying lengths and moves in even, even rhythm across a small range. The text is mainly set with one syllable per pitch and textual phrasing generally aligns with the musical phrasing. However, this is notably not the case at the end of the second phrase, which ends on the first syllable of the word Christos emphasizing the word Christ. And let's listen now to an example of this uh, Armenian chant. <laughs> This next slide shows a reduction of the chant melody in The Water Has Found Its Crack. It's divided into four sections with each one line of text centered on one tetrachord. Like Satagavon and Paras Christos, it consists of mainly stepwise motion of phrases of varying lengths. Different degrees of each tetrachord provide points of resolution which transform the definitions of tonal centers. As the piece comes to a close, the melody ascends to even higher tetrachords while increasing in tempo, but at the end of the piece gradually slows down mirroring the common characteristic in many of the chants of slowing down in the final phrase. The text for the chant section is shown on this slide, and I'll read it for you now. So given the context of the breaks in Armenian history and attempts to mend, uh, to mend them by reclaiming one's heritage, the final lines renewed flowing of stream waters can be read as a reunion with home. Most of the musical phrase endings align with the phrasings of the text. 
However, there are a few moments where the textual and musical phrasing do not align, most notably at the end of the second phrase in the text in the reduction here. Here, the musical phrase ends unresolved on the first syllable of the word kutrav, creating a sense of tension, which is then released at the beginning of the following phrase. And this example is comparable to that of the word Christos in Sotagavor and Parad's Christos. So I'll play for you just an excerpt of the first section of this chant reduction. Ganatskarun, 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 Yekavashun, 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 Kutravjari. This next slide shows the first part of this final section of the piece. The chant melody is split between the sopranos, with each soprano sustaining her pitch as the melody continues in the other voices. This overlapping of voices results in a series of clusters. In addition to partially obscuring the melodic line, these overlapping entrances can obscure the text as the a consonant ending of one syllable doesn't come until after the next syllable has been sung in another voice. The strings here represent an extreme extension of the four, port, four pitch tetrachord scheme, which you can see on the bottom, uh, and it reaches beyond the central pitches on which most of the piece focuses, creating new harmonies that are more distant from the dominant sound world of the rest of the piece. The cello in its lowest register and pitch bends in the strings create dissonant harmonies that push against the harmonically stable melody between the sopranos. As the piece comes to a close, this dissonance fades away and the ensemble melds into one form, a resolution of the friction in an exilic awareness. So now I'll play you the ending of the piece. It's about four minutes.
Writing The Water Has Found Its Crack While Living in Armenia Has Shaped My Sense of Self. This process reconciled what it feels to be Armenian within the sphere of its concrete reality. The negotiation of internal and external boundaries is a central feature of identity maintenance for the dispersed. Music plays a prominent role in this negotiation as art can bring a sense of belonging to people otherwise disconnected from their culture. This feeling of exteriority and interiority is what a crack emphasizes. It is also the story of Armenia, the story of an exiled people longing to be reunited, the story of the water finding its crack. Thank you all, and especially thank you to my performers who you heard today, which are listed here. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, so uh, thank you, Dr. Bohigian. So what we're going to do now is uh, go ahead and if you have questions, we're going to do it through the chat. All right. So just go ahead and write a, a question uh, through the chat. And actually, I've um, already got one question for you. So uh, this question is regarding the use of water. Uh, would you talk a little bit about the meaning of water, both as a life-giving element and as a force of uh, destruction? Uh, it's both longing and a force that ravages the land. So could you just further explain the, the tension and its purpose in your music? Sure. So the idea of using text about water wasn't initially part of uh, what I was going to do. But when I was working at the Komitas Museum, I was translating a lot of folk song lyrics uh, from Armenian into English and noticed that this idea of water kept coming up over and over again. And generally, as I mentioned, metaphors for different things. So I found it really interesting that it was a way of like communication. I mentioned there's the idea of asking the rivers for news from far away. Uh, but then as was mentioned in the question, there's also this idea of uh, destruction. So it was general, I was just generally thinking of that in combination with the idea of the water finding its crack and finding identity and uh, being reunited. So that's why I ended up working with them. Um, I'm not sure if that entirely answered the question, but uh, that's sort of the idea of, I was thinking about flowing and how can I convey that in music in the way that it's being conveyed in the text. So it was the sort of text, uh, like word painting. So I have a question for you. Uh, how, could you explain a little bit about your year in Armenia? You said you were working at the Gomidas Museum and how that worked with your composition. So how did actually traveling to Armenia help you really finish that composition and that, that work? Yeah, so I purposefully didn't have too much of a set plan when I left for Armenia because I wanted to just absorb as much music as I could when I was there and see how that would flow out through me in my own music because I still wanted to do something that was in my own compositional voice but I incorporated these influences, not only of the music that I was listening to in Armenia, but also the music I was familiar with uh, from growing up in Fresno. So it was really that sort of idea of not trying to be too analytical about it while I was in the composition process and just going with whatever ideas were coming with me just because I was going to a lot of concerts. And while I was working at the Komitas Museum, I was uh, looking through their publications of songs that Komitas transcribed. So I was going for something of more of an organic uh, influence rather than I'm going to take this little thing and use it in my piece. And then when I finished, I went back and looked at my piece and analyzed it. Uh, and that's where I found a lot of the similarities uh, that I spoke about in the presentation and also in some other ways. Uh, so I thought it was interesting that there were these little figures that I'd probably listened to so many times that they were stuck in my head and they just came out while I was composing. Okay. So again, if you have, uh, if you have questions, please uh, pose them in the chat. Uh, here's another question. Uh, how will your experiences in Armenia impact your future projects and musical aesthetic? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. It's been something I've been thinking a lot about. Um, I'm definitely wanting to continue to explore this influence of Armenian music and culture in future pieces. Uh, but in the way that I was influenced by it in this piece, which was very different from uh, the influence in previous pieces, like if anyone heard uh, on the All Things Armenian radio show I talked about in my first 
Armenian influence piece, I took a folk song, Tsiranitsa, uh, and sort of broke up the melody. But I specifically in this one wanted to not quote any folk material or other kinds of music. And so I'm looking for other ways that I can expand on this idea. So for example, I working now, uh, later this year, I'll be working on a piece called Rerooted, which is about uh, Syrian Armenians who have resettled in Armenia because of the civil war in Syria. So there's this organization called Rerooted, which uh, does interviews with Syrian Armenians who are in Armenia. And I'm looking to use audio from those interviews uh, in an electronic component of the piece uh, and also explore these ideas of influences from traditional Armenian music. Uh, and I have basically when I was there, I came up with so many different ideas of Armenian influence, uh, Armenian influence ideas that I want to use in future pieces, but I want to continue going in different directions to see where it can take me. Okay, again, uh, if you have questions, go ahead and write them. I want to ask you another question. Uh, it seems as in your research, of course, you, you centered on the question of diaspora dispersion, and you did actually quite a bit of research then in, in the literature, didn't you? Uh, in addition to just the musical side, you had to actually do some, uh, do a lot of research, for instance, with Ani Bakalyan's work and others. So can you tell us a little bit about that, what you uh, helped you discover and how you incorporated that into the music? Yeah, so these are things that I've been reading about over the past several years, uh, just from my own interests. And this was the piece that it really came into use. Um, but I was especially influenced by the work of Sylvia Alajaji, who said she might be here today. I'm not sure if we, she's here right now, um, but she writes on the experience of exile through music uh, in the Armenian diaspora, primarily in the US and in Lebanon. So I really wanted to look at what are other ways, both in music and in other art forms, that Armenians in the diaspora have approached this idea of homeland uh, and these different ideas of homeland. And I'm especially interested in that idea of uh, non-physical homeland that's sort of spread out around the world. Uh, there were really just ways that I wanted to, like things I wanted to be thinking about as I was composing, which is why I ended up doing just a lot of reading. Uh, and hopefully that, that sort of idea comes out in people who are listening to it. But of course I like can only influence how much what people will be thinking about while they're listening to the music. Okay. Are there any uh, further questions? If you, if you do have a question, go ahead and put it uh, in the chat. Otherwise we'll be uh, kind of concluding today's uh, fascinating uh, presentation about, uh, I thought it was fascinating also because how you expressed the contrapuntal music as also this duality and in, in identity. And uh, I think that was quite interesting. I hadn't quite looked at it in that way before. So uh, I guess the, the words of William Saroyan played a big role also in your, yeah. in your work, right? Yeah, they did. Yeah, good. Well, thank you. This has been a, a really uh, wonderful evening. I uh, wanna thank you. This presentation will be, uh, will be archived so you can uh, see it on YouTube if you'd like to go back and take a look at it. Otherwise, we do, have, um, we do have our upcoming events. And if you'd like to stay in contact with us, make sure you do that through the Armenian Studies Program Facebook page or on our uh, website. So thank you for joining us and we'll see you uh, at our next event next week on Thursday, uh, Thursday, February the uh, 25th. Thank you, good evening. Great, thanks Barlow. Thank you. thank you, Dr. Bohegan, thank you. Hi, Dr. Chapman. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs>